Thank you. Hey, just we've got some of the team from. So, questions about this first, and then if there's any other political stuff, we'll let them go. Yeah. Yeah, cool. James? We're ready. Oh, look, th this is a, um, a small but hugely significant investment that we're making here in Canterbury today. $5.4 million is unleashing a huge potential, not only for the Canterbury region, but for New Zealand as a whole. The aerospace industry is one of those examples where New Zealand has huge opportunities. Um, we're talking billions of dollars and thousands of highly skilled, high paid jobs, and our government is committed to investing in those industries. Are we well building in this aerospace industry here in Canterbury? How important is it to come from here? Oh, look, I think Canterbury has huge opportunities. I am going to be a little bit parochial. Um, that uh, Not only do we have great or orbital um, space, uh, but also the proximity to both an air and a seaport and also world-leading universities. Uh, but I might actually ask some of the people who are working in the um, industry, uh, Mark or, or James, you might want to talk about what's happening here in Canterbury and what the potential is for the industry here in Canterbury. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Go. Um, yeah, just, just want to sort of really echo what the Minister was saying about there's, there's really huge opportunity here and there's a really good base of um, all, all the key ingredients you need, you know, um, key infrastructure, personnel, um, a good place to live, easy ac um, access around the place, good base infrastructure, all these sorts of things, and they're, they're all key to growing in industry. What will this money mean for you guys in this uh, I think, I mean, g generally it just enables um, more testing and development and, and so on. And um, again, as, as the Minister has pointed out, you know, working on um, high value technology is, is really critical to um, improving a nation's productivity and um, economic value and, you know, generating more exports and all that sort of thing. And this all is just a catalyst for that. This runway that's new, what, what would that kind of look like? Oh, it just, I mean, it just accelerates and, and eases all of the testing and so on you do. You know, presently, um, there is relatively little infrastructure to support this sort of thing in New Zealand, and so this is a, a big enabler and advancement of that. This will mean that different kinds of testing will be able to take place. Different yeah. times of craft will be able to launch from the site at Kaitariti. Um, that if it was just the grass, um, the grassed area, that wouldn't be possible. Why is this announcement being made now? I mean, we're almost a week out from the election. It's $5.4 million of government funding. Do you think it's appropriate to be announcing that? Oh, thing absolutely. The absolutely. This has gone through the, the usual funding processes. Um, and it is actually important that we keep their momentum up on industries that are so important for our country. Momentum is absolutely critical of what has to happen here. Um, this is um, an application that has gone through the processes in all the normal ways. It just so happens um, that the decision has been made at a, um, at a time close to the election, but um, we cannot afford to take the foot off the pedal when it comes to creating these kind of opportunities in our region and in, in our country. Minister, you look at how well Rocket Lab's gone up north. Is this sort of the South Island's chance to get a piece of that pie in the aerospace sector down here? Uh, look, and, um, I'll, I'll leave some of the industry people to talk to that, but I think what is absolutely critical to understand is what we're developing here at Canterbury um, is really more in that suborbital space, that's, so it's quite different. I think New Zealand has huge opportunity. That means we don't have to just be one place, and I think here in Canterbury we're really developing some critical expertise in suborbital aerospace, some of the stuff that is absolutely critical in terms of what we're going to do in terms of fighting climate change, gathering environmental data, and Canterbury is really well placed to do that. But Mark or Linda, do you want to have a conversation about yeah, that? Yeah, thank you, Minister. Um, the whole, uh, I guess, premise of Tāwhaki was to have a aerospace centre that was multi-use and for multiple people. Rocket Lab is doing tremendously well for our country and globally, uh, but it's a private facility, so our facility caters for the many and the growth of the sector that's um, about to come. Uh, Linda, can I ask Take uh, Tafaki to, to raise the remaining funds needed for this project and 
So this is phase two of Tawhaki's journey. So in 2022, we established um, the country's first multi-use aerospace centre, Grass One runways and so forth uh, for uh, battery-powered drones, gliders, etc. This is phase two, which scales up the site to now include the one kilometre sealed runway and hangar facilities. Uh, that will now cater for a wide range of different craft to take flight test, uh, not just uh, drones and gliders as I was discussing, uh, but a horizontal space launch. Uh, so that takes us to another level and construction of the runway will start in approximately two to three weeks time, hence the announcement today. Do you know uh, how long it will take to raise remaining funds? There's no more funds required in terms of capital investment for this phase, uh, for the sealed, um, sealed runway and the hangar facilities, so we're good. Great. Thank you. But just to return to your question, is this a, a chance for um, the South Island uh, to have its bite of the pie? Absolutely. Minister Woods, um, time for news. Uh, I'm just repeating one of the questions. Uh, why has the government decided to give $5.4 million in funds here? Because of the opportunities. The opportunities for Canterbury as a region and the aerospace industry here, for Tawhaki itself, but also importantly nationally. This is a nationally significant investment. This um, grows our ability to grow what is an exciting part of our economy in terms of the space and aerospace industry. Uh, the kinds of benefits that we can see that will come from having facilities like this um, are hugely important for us, maximising the the potential that lies in aerospace for us. Okay, any? Yep, so we the others. Um, <clears throat> Just, um, I'll just leave the team, just leave the politicians here. Just like to, just like to point out that, of course, the ACT Party has said that space policy is one of the areas that it would like to cut from the services that MB offer. Um, I think this is um, a huge mistake. We can see here today the kinds of opportunities that we will lose if the government is not actively partnering to make sure that New Zealand can realise the potential um, for jobs for well-paid jobs, highly skilled jobs. Um, so that is just another cut that we can point out that will be um, if there is a change of government. Is the Labour Party or the Labour caucus divided on tax? No. Uh, Ingrid Leary reportedly <coughs> said at a meeting in Dunedin last night, quote, the Prime Minister has ruled out a wealth tax and a capital gains tax as long as he's leader and I absolutely support his captain's call. Having said that, the single biggest legacy I'd like to leave in my time as an MP mm -hmm. is I'd like to have a transparent and fair tax system. We made a decision as a caucus and we're very clear about what our position is when it comes to tax. Why do you think she's making those comments? Um, I'm not sure, but we're very clear, and I'm sure everyone here is very clear about what our position is when it comes to tax. She's the second Labour MP in a week to openly support a capital gains tax. Do you think it reflects that you have a growing number of MPs in your caucus who are maybe increasingly nervous about their potential you know, future prospects as an MP? No, um, I, I'm very clear about what our tax policy is. Um, as a caucus, we made uh, very clear decisions around that, and so... Uh, that's, that's what it is. Do you think Labour MPs should be talking openly about their support of a capital gains tax? Well, we're very clear what the decision is that caucus made, um, and that's certainly what caucus members should be speaking to. Yes, yeah, you clearly have caucus members who are potentially, you know, maybe not unhappy with that decision, but clearly disagree with it. Uh, no, we, as a caucus, made a decision, and that's what we're sticking to. Mm. Cast Duncan Webb, have you seen um, Sanitarium, um, their decision about wheat mix in the <laughs> warehouse? That's a big junk. Yeah, Yes, of course, I've seen their decision uh, to stop supplying the warehouse wheat bags. What do you think of it? Um, I commented yesterday, I think their decision increases the price of wheat bags for kids in New Zealand, and I think that's a very poor decision. Oh, have you seen that they're, they're going to resume supplying? I hadn't seen that, but that's great news, and it's great to see them responding to public <laughs> criticism and outrage. <laughs> <laughs> Um, possibly more questions for you, Carmel. OK, uh, shall we try and stick to sorry. one person? <laughs> um, New Zealand First Leader Winston Peters, he's been spreading um, climate misinformation at his public meetings. What do you think about that? Yeah, you might want to save that one for him. 
Okay. Yeah. Don't have any any comments. Well, Okay. Uh, you know, we're concerned about any misinformation that uh, is being shared on the campaign trail, particularly when it comes to something as important as climate change. Uh, clearly, I think our Prime Minister will have something more to say to that. How are you feeling being in Christchurch today? Obviously, um, probably, I don't think you'll need to be here, but you are. I actually was meant to be here, so I was coming down to do some other things anyway. I came down a little earlier uh, to support Megan with this announcement, and it's incredibly exciting. Uh, so a privilege to be here and hear firsthand about the innovation that is occurring here in the um, aerospace sector. Uh, the weather could be a little bit better, uh, not saying that Auckland is always that much better, but otherwise, no, it's great to be here. How disappointing is it to not have the press leaders today today? Obviously a staple for Christchurch in, in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the, the campaign trail, yeah. but how disappointing is it? I think uh, as, as a local MP, as a South Island MP, uh, Megan Woods has been very clear about the impact for South Islanders uh, and perhaps you want to talk a little bit about how that feels as a South Island person that someone doesn't want to front here in Christchurch. I think the press debate has become such an important fixture, fixture of um, election campaigns, grew out of our um, post-quake um, world that we lived in. And look, this is the only debate that happens A, outside of Auckland, and B, in front of a large audience. It is an important debate. It's not too often that us South Islanders get to see our issues put front and centre, mm -hmm. and I think that's why it has grown to be such an important part of the campaign trail. I I just hope that we can find a date. I think Canterburyans and South Islanders deserve to see the people that wish to be Prime Minister of New Zealand front up and talk about the issues that are important down here as well. The negotiations on ongoing. I Got the impression that I understand um, that I mean we've been really clear that Chris is available Friday, he's available Saturday, he's available Sunday, he's available Monday, he's available Tuesday, he's available Wednesday, and he's available Friday. The only day he is not available is the day of the TVNZ debate. So we are bending over backwards to make this debate happen because for the Labour Party, fronting up in Christchurch at a leaders' debate is an absolutely critical part of the interview process to be Prime Minister. But our conversation Ongoing I understand that is. Press. I understand. Um, I mean, that's probably something to put to the leadership team at the press. Uh, we've made our position clear of when we're available, um, and that we, we want to see this happen because it is important. Mm -hmm. you, you are helping run Labor's campaign. You know how logistically challenging it is to move things around. Chris mm -hmm. Luxon and his team have said that he's got a pack schedule for the last week of the campaign. Mm -hmm. Is it fair to be kicking up such a fuss about, about him not being able to make one of those nights available? Look, um, I can tell you, and I'm sure Carmel will echo it, from us watching Prime Ministers over the course of six years, no Prime Minister ever has the luxury of having a set and sewn schedule out for two weeks. Things do happen. Leaders need to be flexible and they need to adjust to the circumstances in front of them. Obviously Chris Hipkins um, getting COVID is something that we didn't want. We didn't want our leader to be in isolation for five weeks. We've had to completely rejig our schedule. Um, that's what campaigns are about. You need to respond to what's in front of you and it certainly is what the job of Prime Minister for which Chris Luxon is currently in an interview process with five and a half million people over. So I think that to show that he's got the ability to pivot and to be flexible um, is important. National's floating the idea of a deputy leaders debate. Deputy Prime Minister, can we rustle that up for seven o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> We've, well, I'm Deputy Prime Minister. Calvin Davis is actually Deputy Leader. Uh, however, I do have a debate on Thursday evening with RNZ and Nicola Willis, so I'm sure that will be interesting. I don't know if 5.5 million people will tune into that, <laughs> but um, I'm sure it'll be interesting. And, um, do you think that the National have enough time to gather all that revenue from their um, homes tax in time as when they say they will? Their homes so tax? Their foreign buyers, foreign buyers tax? Um, Look, I think we're having a chorus of economists that tell us that no, they no. cannot make those numbers add up. There is a giant hole in their fiscal plan from the revenue side of what will be collected from that part of taxation. And actually saw some interesting analysis this morning about the inflationary impact on house prices uh, that Nationals um, f um, foreign buyer tax will have. So not only will it not raise the revenue and leave a giant fiscal hole that will have to be 
be filled by cuts to services, it will also drive up the price of housing for New Zealanders. And what do you make of um, the amount of donations that the, I guess, right-leaning bloc have been making towards some of those right-leaning parties? Look, um, for us as a Labour Party, for over a hundred years, our donations have never come um, in the form of very large donations. So that we have always been a party that has gathered um, our war chest for elections in small lots, usually $2 raffle sales, uh, but we do obviously get donations as well. But look, I think we can see from the scale of um, donations that are going to parties on the right this election that we have some very well-funded opponents. Where do you think that money's going? What, what do you think they're donating to? Broad scale of money that they are. Well, of course, we're in a regulated period, um, so that there are caps on what parties can spend. Uh, but there is no doubt that we are facing opponents that have very full war chests, um, that there are, are people that want to see a change of government. But for the Labour Party, we stand on our record of raising our money um, in the way that we always have for over 100 years. Cool. We'll um, leave you to talk to the Prime Minister this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so, thank you. Yeah. I don't think you want to talk to no, him. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's warm.